Thank you very much and uh, good evening to everybody. Uh, depending upon what time zone you're in or where you're at listening, welcome to uh, early diagnosis, minimally invasive cavity design and bioactive dental materials, a winning combination. I think in the next 50 to 60 minutes, you'll uh, get some really good information, something that uh, um, you can use and apply in your practice tomorrow to have a definite impact on not only your practice, your bottom line, but on on treatment satisfaction and on, on, on patient health and satisfaction. Some of the topics that we will be discussing tonight, early diagnosis and detection of pit fissure caries, stating the standard of care and an opportunity for practice growth. Infected versus affected dentin, what's the difference? What needs to be removed? Comfortable cavity preparation, how to perform conservative preparation without anesthesia in some cases. Streamlining the finishing and polishing of composite resolutions. Bioactive liners and restorative materials, helping teeth heal themselves. So we're, we're going to cover the gamut from diagnosis, preparation, and restoration in a rather interesting way, I think, that you will find um, maybe different from what you're doing. Maybe not, but uh, in all aspects, I think uh, you'll find this a very interesting program. I also want to thank S.S. White uh, for sponsoring this program. Uh, we don't have good educational experiences today without partnering from our manufacturers and educational uh, entities such as Catapult. So uh, again, uh, I encourage you to uh, look on the Catapult website for other programs by some of our other outstanding speaker clinicians and uh, enlighten yourself in many other areas of uh, restorative and practice management. So starting out with a topic, practice growth and great patient outcomes, I think that's something that uh, all of us want to have happen in our practice every day, whether you're a, uh, a young dentist first starting out or, or a seasoned practitioner. Our, our practices thrive on, on growth and, and on great patient outcomes and those patients telling other patients about those outcomes. Some of the industry trends on practice growth. An ADA survey has reported that 27% of the general practitioners are not busy enough and the median annual net income of general practitioners has remained stagnant at about $150,000 for the last five years. A dental publication survey reports two to one that general practitioners view new patient flow as the key to practice growth. And another source reported that a healthy practice should be seeing on an average of 25 new patients per month per doctor. I'll give you a little bit of an editorial on my opinion of those statistics and I think you'll find as this ties to the webinar I think you'll find that you have the patients in your practice doing more procedures and taking care of the patients you have is also I think a very important factor in the growth of your practice So let, let's look at some of the options that we have to expand our services to patients. As I said, I think that ties in at least, uh, I know personally, and I'm not only a teacher and lecturer, but I also have a full-time practice. And my concentration has always been on procedural growth, not necessarily on the number of patients that walk through the door, but on the number of procedures that we perform on the patient we have and there are many different opportunities that we have available to us 
through continuing education today to help expand the services of the general practice. And you can see here from the list, uh, placing implants is at the top of the list. Uh, it's a growing trend, and not only in the, the specialist areas, but in some of the general practices where uh, the dentists are, are placing and restoring implants. Now we know there's a significant curve to learn to do that properly, and there's time involved with taking courses, and not only lost revenue out of the office, but also a significant uh, um, cost to uh, taking the courses and, and, and supplying yourself with the necessary inventory to uh, do your first case. Molar endo, or expanding endodontics in the practice. Uh, I come from Loyola Dental School. Um, uh, and uh, at Loyola, we were well known through uh, Dr. Frank Wine. Uh, the Department of Endodontics had a very high level of reputation. Um, and people that graduated from Loyola often were or said that uh, they wouldn't be referring too much endo out uh, into the uh, specialty areas because we learned to be very proficient. But that's not the case in every school. Uh, and, and in the recent years with the rotary endodontics and, and nickel titanium instrumentation, um, there are opportunities to expand the services, uh, endodontic services uh, in a general practice with, again, um, some CE time to learn procedure and uh, again anytime you're out of the office you are losing revenue um, that you could be making chair side and the cost of those programs while not as expensive as learning to place implants or as time-consuming there is again a significant um, startup going to learn to do endodontics through a microscope that certainly could impact the uh, investment that is made we see underneath that uh, anterior and, and bicuspid endo, uh, not necessarily as difficult on the molar side, but again, something that can be learned and, and augmented into your daily uh, routine of what you offer to patients. Uh, orthodontics and Invisalign, listen to, to Dr. Christensen, uh, implants and orthodontics are two of the major growth areas in restorative general practices over the last several years. Um, Invisalign has enabled um, general practitioners to offer some orthodontic treatment, uh, not, in my opinion, to take the place of, of orthodontists and what they do. And everybody has the ability to cases that they want to do and refer the rest. Um, but again, learning something that uh, I know I said our school was so good in, in endodontics. Uh, we weren't so good with ortho. They taught us enough ortho to be deathly afraid to do any ortho. So that was a little bit more of a reach to go out and learn a discipline which, you know, people go two years to school to learn to be orthodontist. You're not going to learn one week. But there are certain mild crowding and rotating, uh, rotated cases that uh, do lend themselves to um, minor tooth movement and Invisalign that, uh, that a general practitioner, should they want to breach, reach out, can look at adding that to their practice. But again, um, there's a significant cost involved and time out of the office. And, and with products like Invisalign, uh, there is a, a cost every time you do a case to have the aligners made. Botox, some states, I work in a state where uh, dentists cannot give Botox uh, or do fillers. Some states do allow that, and um, that uh, I, I think is something that if you're in a state where, where that is allowed, there, that's again something that can be offered as an adjunctive service um, to dentists uh, um, in a general practice. Tooth whitening is something that most of us have been doing for years. This is a relatively low cost item to, uh, as far as uh, lost revenue and time out of the office and, and additional CE time and, 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 and can also add a, a nice little area to your practice uh, if you're not doing a lot of tooth whitening. Uh, this, I know in my 
as we've been doing whitening uh, to your side take home for years and often whitening is a gateway to doing other treatment. Lastly, what you'll see down there is comfortable cavity preparation. And that's what we're going to concentrate on tonight. Because the one thing you're going to see here by the procedures that we talk about is that this is going to be very little to no lost time, no lost revenue, no cost for CE, very minor investment, burrs. The potential growth is really the big number there because of uh, internal referral. What's the best source of referral? Your satisfied patients. So looking at all these options, I think you'll find when we discuss what we discussed tonight is something that I think few practices are really practicing, but that every practice can implement and make successful. Patient satisfaction is key to referral. Saving time. Clinicians have reported completing 500 cavity preparations with a smart bird too. We'll tell you what that is. With no anesthesia, saving a, a lot of hours per year in chair time. Now again, to me, I, I don't count the number of hours I save, but I do count how long it takes a procedure and how comfortable a patient is and how satisfied we are at the end of the day and we do know that most of us that we use local anesthesia and that's the majority of dentists there is a time while we have to wait for the anesthesia to take effect so if there are some procedures that can be completed comfortably without the use of anesthesia patients again don't like the needles right so there is a potential there for time savings patient satisfaction and growth. This little flow chart just kind of shows what goes on in an average practice as far as, you know, the average doctor seeing uh, or performing a, a 1,000 to 1,100 cavity preparations in a year uh, divided up between class 1, class 3, class 5. And, and just imagine that you can take a portion of those and do those anesthesia free with a system such as comfortable cavity preparation. The amount of chair time you would save and the referrals on that. It's, it's something that I think everybody needs to consider. Now what cases work best for comfort, comfortable cavity preparation? Obvious class ones and also uh, class fives uh, because as we'll show with the technique uh, in, in introduction into the enamel is done with a fisherotomy burr which is a precise small carbide instrument that conserves a a small amount of tooth structure making entry into a pit fissure or as I see in the lower slides a class 5 area and then when decay is in dentin you heard me mention smart burr, smart burr 2. Smart burrs are polymer burrs they're made out of a, a plastic of the specific new hardness of healthy dentin so they only cut infected dentin which again conserves healthy tooth structure. Carbide when excavating dentin doesn't discriminate between infected dentin or healthy dentin. It cuts everything. Now, if your patients don't know about this. Most doctors don't talk about this, you know, as far as comfortable cavity preparation and using um, fissurotomy burrs and enamel and, and polymer burrs and dentin. So patient education is obviously a, a, a critical thing to spread the word um, because we know that you know a lot of patients still feel that going to the dentist is an unpleasant experience whether it's from getting the injection or having a procedure so sit down with your staff tell them what you do let them be able to explain to patients about what you're doing different than what the majority of the offices around are doing um, chair side education materials are available through SS White, as lobby uh, education materials are as well. So take advantage of all these things. Anytime you're implementing something new in your practice, you got to tell people about it. So let's start with early diagnosis of dental decay, caries management, a new paradigm. How accurate is a new explorer? How accurate is 
your explorer? Is it time to say goodbye to the old standard? This is a quote from my friend, Dr. Lou Graham, the uh, founder of Catapult Education. Is there a concern over hidden carries? What is hidden carries? How can we differentiate between a stain and a carious lesion? Our profession typically watches things get bigger, and that's been the standard of care. Cavities, decay, rarely heal themselves, but they do expand over time. And, and if our goal, and I know my goal for my patients is to keep their teeth for the, their lifetime and patients are living into their 80s and 90s, putting a big hole in the surface of a, a molar like that for a small carious lesion in dental school, the GV Black Class 1 Extension for Prevention Cavity Preparation, really doesn't make much sense anymore. Now, the, the picture on the left, is that a stain or is it, a, is it carious? You know, we look at an x-ray of this extracted tooth. We, we can't always tell um, what's going on on x-ray, um, particularly in the Pitt and Fisher area. It's more for a diagnosis of, of uh, proximal decay. So the things that we've relied upon for years, clinical examination and x-ray to detect early caries is really a very difficult call. And I'll tell you more times than not, here's a cross-section through that actual tooth. We know that the Pitt and Fisher caries is the tip of the iceberg, and that once the caries penetrates through the dentinoenamel junction, it spreads laterally, and the side of the triangle reverses, and the triangle port points now toward the pulp as the dentin and caries expands laterally. How long do we want to watch? How long do we want to wait? How conservative is it not to be minimally invasive when at the first sign of a carious issue? Here we see various issues around teeth that had been previously sealed with glass ionomer sealants. White decalcification can be an indication of hidden caries. Pitt and Fisher staining can be an indication of hidden caries. Sealants that are badly breaking down or breaking down for a reason. So there should be a concern. Surface stain, subsurf subsurface stain, white decalcification. Studies on diagnostic care that X-ray and explorers are rated poor diagnostic tools for occlusal surfaces. Visual methods and caries risk assessment should mean uh, remain a standard for clinical diagnosis of occlusal caries. 92% of teeth with subsurface stains or white decalcification have decay present. So, go back to the explorer. What's your protocol? Let's look at number 15, occlusal pit, number 31, occlusal pit, number 18, occlusal pit. 15 and 31 have slight sticks. What is a slight stick? Is that like being slightly pregnant? I don't know. It's either sticking or it's not sticking. There's either decay or not decay. It's not almost decay. Number 18, no stick. What if the fissure is so narrow that the end of the blunt probe, quote unquote, the explorer, can't get in it to stick? And you know, after autoclaving explorers several thousand times as we do in our practices, on a weekly, monthly basis, they're no longer really that diagnostic. What's the patient's caries risk assessment? Do they have a lot of surfaces that are filled? Do they call you at five months and 30 days and say, where's my recall card? I'm due for my cleaning. Or is it the patient doesn't know which end of the toothbrush has the bristles? Is it the patient that has multiple, multiple surface fillings? Is it the patient that comes in when something hurts? Do we treat all these diagnoses the same? Because though all those patients could have what you see on the top of the screen. What does your patient want? Does your patient want to keep their healthy tooth or maintain as much of the healthy tooth as possible? One thing, I, I've been practicing this profession 
30 years. Why is it that we get paid for more of the tooth we take away? Shouldn't we get paid better for more of the tooth we save? Doesn't make sense, right? The Explorer, 15 or 31 slight sticks, 18 no stick. Do you drill? Do I drill? What's the patient's carries risk assessment, as we mentioned? What does the patient want? Do you still diagnose pit pressure decay like Fred Flintstone and Barney Rubble's dentist? I will guarantee you the majority of the people still do. Let's watch it. Let's watch it till it gets bigger. And then I can justify putting a cold piece of steel on it and cutting a cavity preparation. Let's be conservative and watch the disease grow. I'm being facetious here, but think about it for a second. As I tell patients, is that if you, you had a pinpoint melanoma on your hand and somebody diagnoses that as melanoma, do you want to wait and watch and see if it's arrested, see if it's going to get bigger? Wait till it's the size of a grapefruit before you have it excised. Do you want to get it the heck out of there now? I think we know the answer to that question. Diagnodent from Cabo Kerr is a, a caries detection tool that it allows us to indicate or to detect early decalcification in teeth. Now, Diagnodent has been around for several decades. I lecture quite frequently and ask how many people use Diagnodent. I will venture to say that if 15 to 20 percent of the hands go up, that's a lot. Now, in general, if the number on, on the diagonal reads over 30, there's decay present, decalcification, early decay. You still have to be a doctor. If the patient has a fissure with a 27 or a 30 and they've got no other fillings in their mouth, I might wait till the next recall visit and check it again. If it goes up to 50, it's not going in the right direction. Decisions have to be made. So here on number 15, we had a 64 on the diagonal Number 31, and we had a 31. Number 18, the one that no stick, had a 38. Another way to detect caries is for use of, uh, use of uh, a device called carry view. For interproximal detection, carry view is a way to look at interproximals through transillumination. You can see early decay with transillumination and carry view a lot of times before it even shows up on the x-ray. Find carious lesions and cracks often not seen on teeth in x-rays. Help identify recurrent caries. Help identify fractures. These pictures can be stored in the patient's digital record, can be provided to insurance companies. Here's some infrared images with carry view on the right. You can, you, on the left, you can see the clinical picture. Is that cusp okay? Uh, on the uh, uh, carry view, we can see that that cusp is about ready to cleave off the side of that tooth like uh, ice off of an iceberg in Alaska. So patients will ask me something like this. Well, you know, I, you really need a buildup and a crown there. Well, it's not bothering me. How long do I have? How long can I wait? My answer always is, call me the day before it breaks. How about fluorescence technology? This is a newer technology that I think is really on the cutting edge of caries detection. This particular device from Air Techniques is like a Doppler radar for caries detection to be able to analyze and look at the fluorescent capability of carious tooth structure. Obviously, you see where it's red, that's deep caries. Where you see in the yellow areas in the dentin, that's deep dentin carries, so it can quantify in three dimensions the, the depth and extent of the carious lesion. Color mapping, quantifying the lesion beyond the scope of diagnodent. What's your office protocol? Well, here, three lesions again, and we've got carries in all three. Now, here's another device. In this particularly, I actually, I, I use intraoral cameras and have used them for years in the office to, to do tours of the mouth and show patients at close up on a TV screen what the oral condition is like. This particular camera has a caries detection function through fluorescence. This is Soprocare by Acteon. And you can 
its detection mode, as the slide shows on the upper right, we can differentiate whether that's stain or whether that's active decay through fluorescent technology. This is well documented in the literature. This isn't something that's that's just new, and it, you know, but it's well documented that we can describe and detect caries much earlier with these technologies than with an explorer. We'll take a look up close. Now, comfortable cavity preparation. Here's the kit from SS White. You're going to see in the front we have fissurotomy burrs. A fissurotomy burr in a lesion like this is going to conserve the amount, a uh, healthy amount of tooth structure. And as I tell patients, you see the red, that's decay. I can just take a small instrument and get that red out rather than take a larger burr. And people like this, like the cancer surgeons where they take a big clean margin because they're not sure where the cancer is. Well, we know where the decay is and we don't necessarily have to cut in the fissure where we don't see the red. So minimal preparations with the fissurotomy were done here, and these restorations were done to help preserve and treat these early lesions and maximize the amount of tooth structure that's saved. So comfortable cavity preparation and fissurotomy, I think they go hand in hand. We know there's no uh, nervous innervation in enamel, so if decay is in enamel only, we certainly can use a fissurotomy burr without anesthesia. I always give the patient an option, of course, but we are most always are willing to try without anesthesia first. The comfortable cavity preparation kit includes fissurotomy burrs for the minimally invasive exploration and preparation in enamel. The smart burr twos, which are for dentin excavation, removal of infected dentin. Uh, the great white burrs are are carbide burrs for restoration removal, such as PFMs. Uh, the finishing burrs and polishers are for the finishing of the restorative material. This is a good little illustration to show the difference between a 330 pair and a fissurotomy burr and how much healthy tooth to gain access to a, a, a carious pit uh, in a particular molar. And if you look at numbers and, and, and amount of tooth material removed, you can compare uh, between uh, uh, the NTF, that's a fissurotomy burr, and a 557 or 330. You can see dramatically that at, at depths of 0.5, 2 millimeters and 4 millimeters, at 4 millimeters, a fissurotomy only takes away less than a, milli uh, less than a millimeter, 0.927 a millimeter of, of, of two structure where you've got three times the amount of two structure removed with a 557 or a 330 pair. Now smart burrs in health in, in dentin, talk, one of the uh, talking points was what's the difference between infected dentin and affected dentin? Well infected dentin has bacteria. It's decalcified, it's mush, it's infected, it's got to come out. Affected dentin is Early demineralization where calcium and phosphate has been leached out of the dentin. But it's not infected. Bacteria are not present. Affected dentin is subject to remineralization by bioactive filling materials. And that's going to be the third part of the puzzle. Early detection, minimal preparation, and bioactive. This shows entry into a, a central pit on a molar with a fissurotomy burr and, and carries as it's spread laterally at the DEJ. Now, if you look at the new hardness of enamel, it's between 360 and 440. The new hardness of a carbide burr, 1600. So that's going to cut through enamel fairly easily. Infected dentin, the new hardness is 0 to 30. Health or unaffected, 70 to 90. So you see, this is specifically designed, the Smart Burr 2, to cut the infected dentin and minimize and prevent cutting of healthy tooth structure. Here the SEM show the dentinal tubules are open after use of conventional carbides. And we know that smear layer is there and, and tubules are open, which uh, once we get into dentin and open tubules, 
the, the chance of causing uh, a sensation of pain through uh, the dental tubule fluid stimulating the C fibers in the pulp, et cetera, is high. This SCM on the right shows cutting the dentin, removing the infected dentin with a smart per two, and it shows the no open tubules. In fact, the tubules get plugged. So preventing the tubular fluid movement and having less of a chance for sensitivity being instrumented. Now, some of these patient trials were conducted at NYU, and 95% of the dentists that were involved in these trials uh, rated removal decay as good or excellent. 97% of the cavity preparations were successfully completed without the need for anesthesia. 100% dent removal resulted in no pain with, uh, without use of anesthesia, no request for anesthesia by patients, no sensation other than vibration was reported. 9.5 rating on comfort level, 10 being the most comfortable. Patients like this, if you can do this without anesthesia, the patients will be appreciative. I don't know anybody that would prefer an injection if they don't need it. Well, again, this is the uh, research that was done at NYU. Uh, and and repeating the and just again showing the, the difference between cutting with a carbide versus cutting with SmartBird 2. I thought it would be good to look at that again after the discussion. Open tubules on the left, closed tubules on the right. The University of Maryland study concluded use of SmartBird 2 as an eff efficient method for caries, uh, removal of caries infected dentin while preserving caries unaffected dentin and conserving healthy tooth structure. This slide I, I put in just as an aside because Dr. Ron Jackson, a good friend of mine, always talked about composites being not necessarily always need to be replaced. They can be renewed. If there's, a, if there's some minor micro leakage around a, a, a composite margin where a good adhesive procedure had been performed, we don't necessarily have to remove the entire restoration. We can remove the area that's, uh, that's defective and using a fissurotomy burr is the best minimal invasive way to do that. And then you can re-etch and bond and renew a composite restoration. And so, you know, we see too many pictures of people showing, you know, uh, all recurrent decaries and micro leakage around composites where there's a little bit of brown stain around a margin that would be erased in a tenth of a millimeter with the tip of a fissurotomy burr. Uh, this happens quite often. Finishing composites in the comfortable cavity preparation kit, uh, we have 12 blade uh, carbide finishers for pre-polishing and, and 20 blade for, um, uh, I'm sorry, 12 blade for contouring and 20 blade for polishing. I really prefer carbides versus uh, diamonds uh, in most cases for, for finishing and contouring and polishing composite. Different on ceramic, but composites, uh, really get a nicer surface texture, in my opinion, more natural surface texture when using uh, a carbide burr. The 12 blades, I said, ideal for uh, initial shaping and contouring, and the 20 blades for pre-polishing prior to rubber polishing abrasives, which you see here, the JS Supreme Point and the, and the Supreme Cup for the final polishing. These JS polishers allow clinicians to uh, create surface with a one-step polisher and then in a couple of minutes I prefer to use these in electric with water and run them at about six six thousand rpm or less now let's talk about the third factor bioactive materials now we have several available on the dent uh, on the market and dental market now of uh, ceramic crown and bridge which is a uh, crown and bridge some Meant Theracal LC, which is a bioactive liner, Biodentin, which is a bioactive buildup material, Activa Restorative from Pulp Dent, a, a, a bioactive restorative material, and Beauty Fill, a composite of, with Gymer technology from Shofu. These are materials that are actually interacting with the tooth to help provide, in some cases, calcium and phosphate to help re. 
in some cases, ion diffusion to disrupt the biofilm and make the surfaces more difficult for plaque to accumulate and adhere to. Conventional composite and amalgam and gold and porcelain do not do these things. So again, I, one of the things I always emphasize in my lectures, we got to be doctors here. Don't just put any filling material in every tooth, in every some patients have immaculate hygiene. Some don't know which end of the toothbrush have the bristles. Start using materials that best fit the patient and the tooth. Now, why is bioactivity so important? Biomineralization, it's the key. The exchange of calcium and phosphate ions forming appetite. We have the ability to rebuild appetite at the molecular level. Bioactive materials are dynamic. Some of these materials, when phosphate is used, they can recharge from the environment, from the saliva, from, um, from the tubular fluids. Uh, the oral environment is constant flux of pH change where the ion diffusion can help influence the pH of the microenvironment. Obviously, acidic pH uh, will cause demineralization. If we can get the pH up, there's less of a chance for the calcium and phosphate to be demineralized the two structure. Uh, this is a, a key uh, thing with uh, bioactive smart materials. So let's look at a class one fissurotomy restoration using a gyomer. As I mentioned, the fissurotomy burrs are the key to the dimension of keeping the cavity preparation as minimally invasive as possible. And we have a couple of different designs. We have the original design at the top, the micro NTF in the middle, and the micro STF shorter shank uh, at the bottom. Now, what is a gyomer? A gyomer is a composite, but it's a composite with a glass filler that is specially treated. It's treated with polyacrylic acid, and then there's a layer of glass ionomer where you see the ion uh, diffusion layer, the glass ionomer phase, and then that is covered with a surface modified layer to protect those ions from disappearing too quickly, so they're available over time. Now, gyomers will cause a couple of things to happen. The formation of an acid-resistant layer because of the ion diffusion. You're going to increase the pH of the microenvironment around the restorative. Reinforcement of two substance. Remineralization in some cases. Anti-plaque effect because biofilm is going to be harder to adhere. Acid buffering capacity, a big one. Because we know that as the pH goes down, more demineralization can't. If we can buffer the acids, the acid byproducts from bacterial metabolism, we can lessen the effect that plaque and the byproducts of plaque can have on causing decay in teeth. Early detection with fluorescence, minimal cavity preparation using fissurotomy burrs. You can see those preparations on the, the three teeth in the lower right quadrant, quite minimally invasive no undermining of enamel. And then using adhesive technology, a gyomer, heavy bodied flowable, um, the SS white uh, 20 fluted uh, finishing burrs to perform minor occlusal adjustments. And then polishing. Now in the fissures in the posterior teeth, sometimes the cups and the points, the jazz polishers don't have access to some of those really small micro fine fissures. In that case, an ASAP polisher from Clinician's Choice is a good, good uh, instrument to use. But those restored teeth on the lower right, very hard to see that those teeth were ever invaded. And now they've got a protective smart material in there that will not only help seal the fissure, but help create a microenvironment to protect. Here's two examples where uh, the, the decay went through the enamel into the dent. And again, these could have been easily missed by an explorer. You can see on the, uh, that second molar, there, there's no stick to be found there. This is hidden caries, but it's caries nonetheless. So once we get into the dentin, you can take out a smart burr, remove the infected dentin, and perform the restoration. In this case, we use a total etch procedure, an adhesive procedure, um, uh, adhesive bonding resin placed, air thin light. 
here, and then a Gymer composite. So you, we see these areas all the time. Let's watch them. Let's not watch them. Why watch it get bigger? If you've got isolated areas in a molar like this, why cut a big dog bone extension for prevention cavity preparation like this man, young man, Dr. G.V. Black, our, our hero, the hero of operative dentistry. I happen to have a, an autographed copy of his book from 1918 after uh, uh, teaching at Loyola for 10 years. This was given to me as a gift, but we don't follow Dr. Black's extension for prevention anymore. We follow Ron Jackson's change of those words, prevention of extension. You don't necessarily have to take out all the grooves. You can diagnose with, with fluorescence which grooves have caries and which have stain and which are unaffected and just remove the areas where decay is present. The carbide finishing burrs, first shaping with a 12 blade and then pre-polishing with a 20 blade. So you're using electric hand pieces. I like to use electric because I can, I can set the RPMs and, and create a real uh, controlled, surf, uh, controlled um, a reduction. Finishing and polishing with a jazz uh, polishing point or an ASAP, depending upon access. And that restoration in these teeth is undetectable and protective. We don't need to watch that get bigger to put a bigger filling in. One thing I always say in lecture too, you know, we're, we're taught in dental school that everything we do is to last forever. Nothing Thing we do will last forever. I don't care how good of a dentist you are, what material you use. Muscles always win. Decay, bacteria, microenvironment, teeth, uh, and, and occlusion and chewing is a self-destructive act. As patients live longer and keep their teeth, we're going to need to think more conservatively initially because we want to have tooth structure around when the patient. This is a 32-year-old patient. You know, I'm, that may last for another 10, 15, 20, 30, I don't know how many years, but if that restoration needs to be redone, there will be a maximal amount of healthy tooth left once that restoration is remade. Now, bioactive cavity lining agents. Here we have a, a significant carious lesion. Open that up. Now we're going to highlight the smart bur 2 and remove the infected dentin. Now when the smart bird 2 stops cutting and I cut at 6,000 RPMs, I place a bioactive cavity liner and this is well documented in the literature. You don't use caries detection dye. You don't worry about leathery dentin or stuff that sticks as long as the smart bird doesn't cut it out. It's affected dentin and can be remineralized. So a bioactive liner is placed. This is Theracale from Visco. A light cured resin modified calcium silicate pulp protectant liner to perform as a barrier and to protect the dental pulpal complex. One such liner, bioactive, that's indicated for both indirect and direct pulp capping. The calcium release affects mechanically sealing of the pulp, hydroxyapatite formation, secondary bridge formation, alkaline pH promotes healing and appetite formation, while the resin component performs a moisture so that the bond doesn't break down, improves the ability to form a durable seal. Here's a slot preparation in a class two, early decay. Maybe this was found on x-ray, maybe not. Maybe it was found with carry view. But you can see when it's cut, uh, you got demineralization there for sure, and you've got decay just inside the dental enamel junction. So in this case, uh, a small uh, carbide burr from the comfortable cavity preparation kit was used to perform a slot preparation. There was no decay in the grooves. There you can see those burrs on the comfortable cavity preparation kit down on the right side. Once the sectional matrix is placed, now you, you don't see a rubber dam there. I'm using isolite and I'm in close taking pictures, but isolation is critical for any adhesive procedure. 
as is, I believe, a sectional matrix. You can see how well adapted that matrix is to the vertical walls of the cavity preparation. And I'm going to use a flowable material. This is a gyamer flowable, a bulk fill gyamer flowable. Here you can see the, the cavity preparation completely filled, light cured, removal of the matrix, very little finishing and polishing to be done, and a nice conservative restoration for that small uh, carious lesion. Now the class five, class fives we do all the time in practice. And where do we see plaque around the gingival margins? Now this is a nice photomicrograph to see the gyamer's anti-plaque effect. Here you can see uh, a gyamer flowable on the, the left where there's partial plaque formation. Not much, but there is a little bit. But then you look at mature plaque on a, a non-gyamer type of flowable. A tremendous difference. So which flowable do you want to do a class 5 with on your patient that doesn't know which end of the toothbrush has the bristles? I think the point is clear. Now I call this the smart class five because I use a fissurotomy burr to place micromechanical retention at the gingival pulpal line angle because there's going to be flexure. Class fives have a lot of flexure because the, the fulcrum of, uh, of movement is, you know, gingival crest. And class five margins fail, uh, particularly if there's not a lot of enamel there or no enamel. Uh, because of that flexure and the ability, inability to maintain a long-term seal. I also increase the length of my bevel. Here you can see the bevel on the enamel up to two to three millimeters. Now that's going to help with blending the restorative material, but it's also going to help um, help negate the effect of flexure from a So I've done a selective etch technique and I'm using a gyamer flowable to fill up the, the dentin part of the cavity preparation. And then using a gyamer paste fill, um, nano fill, to uh, create the cervical contour and, and place the enamel part of the restoration. And what you see on the right is immediately after finishing. You see, I, I get a little bit of a a rub on the uh, on the gingiva there from from my my finishing uh, um, polishers, but where's the composite? Can't see it. Where's the gingival margin? Can't see it. Here's another case done on a, an upper cuspid at placement and one week after placement. Now, if you get a class five that goes slightly subgingival, make it for gingival. I don't know how anybody practices without a diode laser. This is a Gemini uh, from Ultradent, which actually is a new class of super pulsed lasers, which means you can cut more efficiently at a higher power with less necrosis and tissue damage. So I'm going in and, and doing a little bit of a gingivectomy here to make a super gingival margin and then doing the Class five, as I showed before, filling the internal part of the cavity preparation with a gyamer heavy-bodied flowable, and then finishing the contour with the nano-hybrid gyamer material. Light curing, finishing with the 12-fluted uh, SS white finishing burr, followed by the 20-fluted, and then the jazz polisher on that smooth surface, and you can see another smart class five completed. Now, materials that set a standard for bioactivity, Activa Restorative from Pulp Dent is one such material because it's not really composite. It's not really resin-modified glass ionomer. It's really in a class by itself. It can be used as a bulk fill material. In, in, in pediatric dentistry, I don't know why anybody would use a conventional composite anymore. It's hard enough to fill a, a, a pediatric uh, preparation on a moving target with saliva and, and uh issues all over the place and, and big pulps and small teeth and all that stuff. But not just for pediatrics, for all patients, carries control. Anything in dentin that is expansive, you know, some of these lesions we open up small and they get big. Older patients where saliva has changed and their pH and their microenvironment is compromised. This can be used as a bulk fill because it's a dual cure. 
And Activa is a material because it, it acts like a battery. It has calcium, phosphate, and fluoride in it, which can be diffused out of the material and into the tooth to remineralize, demineralize tooth structure. And once the battery is depleted, it can pick up calcium and phosphate and fluoride from food, toothpaste, water, saliva, tubular fluid, and recharge the battery. So there's a constant ion exchange between the acid groups and the ionic resin of Activa and the tooth structure, which occurs at a molecular level. Overcoming the root cause of restorative failure, that is demineralization, and providing those ions back to the tooth to stimulate appetite crystal formation and fill micro gaps and seal margins. No conventional restorative materials do that. Here's an SCM showing Activa um, in the presence of moisture, saline in this case in 21 days, showing calcium phosphate appetite crystal formation on the surface of the material. Comparing compressive strengths, looking at Filtech and the gray bar on the left, it's composite. Activa, the red bar, it's almost as high of compressive strength as composite. You can see where the uh, resin modifieds and straight glass ionomers go down considerably. They're not meant as permanent restorative materials. Now, wear rates on Activa, you can see Fuji 9 is way up there. It doesn't have a good wear rate. Activa is down there at the bottom with Tetric, Ivoceram, and Filtec, and all the other composites because it wears like composite. So we get the ion diffusion. We have compressive strength and wear like composite with this material, low water solubility, so it's not gonna imbibe and expand. And it has fluoride release and recharge and calcium and phosphate availability. So root surface decay can be taken care of very easily. Plus, because it's dual cure and has an, a, a mixing tip with a metal cannula that you can bend, you can limit the amount of material in these areas and get them restored effectively. This is heroic dentistry, but this is an older patient that can't afford losing that bridge and having implants. So we're buying time. Here's a caries control patient. We can minimize the opening to get our smart burrs in and do our excavation and then do a bulk fill with Activa and restore these teeth. Here's another class one, before and after finished with Activa. You can see that it's a very aesthetic material and it polishes very nicely. Here's a class two and a class one. These relatively new slides I just added to the program a couple of weeks ago. So Activa can be used in a host of restorative situations as the complete restorative material. And showing in the bottom right, the class two in the second premolar and the class one completely finished and polished. So I, I think in this presentation, what I've tried to do is show you a, three different things, how, how to be proactive and diagnose decay early. Microfissurotomy technique to remove only the, the, the bad and leave as much of the good as you can and then restore with a bioactive material that's gonna help replenish and rebuild calcium and phosphate ions back into the demineralized tooth structure and help protect by ion diffusion and pH change and, and, and making plaque harder to stick. All of these things that bioactive materials in dentistry are helping us provide to our patients. I hope you've had some good information from this webinar. Um, my email address I'll have at the end, boblodds at aol.com. If you have any questions that I can help answer, we're going to get to some questions here. We have a few minutes, but we might not be able to get to them all. We'll see what we've got. Thank you so much. Again, I'm going to go over now to the, uh, the question board and see what we've got here. How do all these methods differentiate caries from arrested caries? Let me ask you this, Mike. How do you know whether decay is arrested or whether it's active? How do you differentiate? Let me this, if it's your tooth, if you have an early detection, and let's say it's arrested, and you put something into this protective to prevent that from unarresting and being aggressive, because we know even arrested caries can reactivate,
Or if it's not arrested and it's active, how do you know it? Here's my feeling on that. Uh, arrested carries and all that, it's nice in the, in, the, in, the, uh, in the lab to make these differentiating calls. Us as clinicians, how do you differentiate arrested carries with an explorer? The answer is you don't. I take a more aggressive approach. I, I, I think that, you know what, over time, and, and uh, for all the lesions that we've gone into with fisheronomy burrs, I can't tell you there has been a time when I haven't seen something there. So my preference as a clinician and a doctor is not to chance that this is not an arrested lesion, that if I detect something that's there, with decay fluorescence and verify that clinically with a fisheronomy burr and can see it and place a bioactive material. My opinion, Mike, that's the standard of care. And that's what I've been on my soapbox talking about for the last several years. So we'll see where we go with that. Uh, I, I can tell you using fluorescence for, for over a year now, at the magnification that you can see into fissures with that camera, if it's not fluorescing, then it's either arrested or it's not decay. If it's fluorescing, it's active byproducts that are from bacteria that are. So um, I think we should be moving toward um, that level of diagnosis for all of our patients. Um, is there any benefit to cavity cleansing with Gluma? Uh, Jack, absolutely there's a benefit. Uh, and and when, when I cut a cavity preparation into dentin, uh, Gluma is, is going to cut uh, or going to, uh, let me re rephrase, when, when I cut into dentin and you have open tubules, what's Gluma do? It closes the tubules. What does acid etching and total etch do? It opens the tubules. So absolutely, uh, Gluma is going to be an adjunct, and I, I use desensitizers also, even in a self-etch mode because of the antibacterial effect. Um, what are your thoughts on sealing these lesions without doing a fissurotomy? Uh, Jacob, good question. Uh, I, I tell you, though, when you look at these lesions with a camera, uh, a single toothbrush bristle won't get down there. So I, I think in order to prevent these lesions from expanding in the future, um, that uh, opening the, the grooves up with the fissurotomy burr so that we can get a bioactive filling material, not glass ionomer, because glass ionomer, again, like sealants, are going to break down and wear away with time much quicker than an Activa or, or a, a, a giant. Um, but I, I think that's really, in my mind, the, the, the best long-term treatment. Do you usually place a flowable in a class two to start? The answer is yes, unless it's a bulk fill flowable. Then, and, and the reason is because the first layer of being flowable will, will adapt to the geometry of the cavity preparation uh, much better than, than going strictly with a, a paste. Thoughts on silver diamine fluoride. I don't have a lot of experience with that, John, but I tell you, I think in older patients where silver diamine fluoride shows such an effective thing that the downside is uh, they turn the teeth black. Uh, but, you know, again, I'd rather have a black stained tooth than not have a tooth at all. I don't think that uh, I would, uh, you know, in silver diamine fluoride on, on pediatrics and primary teeth, absolutely. Um, on, on the rest of the patient population, I'm holding off on that just a little bit, but uh, I'm not an expert on that, and there are other people that uh, talk a lot about that. Uh, you can find some information on that, actually. Um, Riva Star is a silver diamine fluoride product from uh, SDI. Um, they've got a lot of information on that. How strongly do you recommend Carry View? Tom, I tell you, Carry View and, and uh, the SoPro camera I use quite extensively. Um, they perform different things. I, I, I wish Carry View had an intraoral camera attached to it. Uh, that would make that, I think, even more useful. But it is extremely useful uh, because a, a, a lot of what we do, at least in my practice, is replacement. I've, I see patients between 40 and 60 years old that have had alloys and, and big 
the direct fillings and trying to diagnose cracks in teeth. And, and that is very, very difficult. And Carry View does an extremely good job of that. So I, I highly recommend it. I think I'm down to the end of the questions. Um, and, and I think we're down to the end of our time. Thank you. I, I appreciate your comments. And uh, um, I thank you for your kind attention. And thank you to, to Catapult um, for uh, providing a platform for this webinar and to SS White for helping to support this program. Again, if there are more questions, I'd be happy to help you out in any way I can. Just send me an email at B-O-B-L-O-W-E-D-D-S at AOL.com.